we are going to watch, I'm going to share the pre-recorded video of a high quality, which we prepared specially for you with Bartish. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. So today I want to talk about algebra. Um, and I learned algebra two times. First time, you know, high school, equations, uh, expressions, and then um, algebras in category theory. And these are called F algebras. And they were like completely different. I had no connection between um, what we call algebra in high school and what we call algebra in uh, category theory. And then there's in between high school algebra and category theory, there is um, programming. And in, in programming, algebras come into play when, when we talk about recursion schemes. Maybe some of you have heard of, about recursion schemes. Well, you definitely heard about folds, right? Folding stuff. That's, that's a, like the simplest recursion scheme. And it uses a, an algebra. And usually we don't talk about the place where algebra uh, sits inside a fold. But it is like if you want to generalize it, like folding not just a list, but a tree or some more complex data structure, then suddenly, you know, you have to understand that you are actually doing algebra. But this is a different kind of algebra. And then at some point it clicked, you know, that these two notions of algebra actually have a common root. And it's just one is a, uh, a generalization of the other. So today I will talk about how we get from the high school algebra part all the way through data structures, recursion schemes, some simple recursion schemes, um, and category theory. And hopefully this will be like an intro into category theory that's not too hard to understand because we approach it from the perspective of program. So we have, we have these expressions, like x squared plus 3x plus 4. This is what we understand as algebra, right? How do we form expressions like this? Um, and how we evaluate expressions like these. There are two parts to algebra. And that's it. That's, that's just it in, in a nutshell. So as programmers, we look at an expression like this and we say, uh, how do I parse something like this? I will parse it into an expression tree, right? So I have a plus, okay? So this plus will be a node in my tree and it has two children, x squared and 3x plus 4. OK, but what is x squared? Well, I have to recursively like, erase this thing right, and say this is really a product, a multiplication of x times x. So I have the leaf nodes in my tree that are variables. And this is again a plus, okay, so I'll replace this with plus, and one child is 3x, so it's a multiplication, it's a product of a constant 3 and the same variable x, variable of the same name, and then finally plus constant 4. So this is a data structure. So now we are looking at it from the programmer's point of view. We have a data structure, and we can encode this data structure in a language, in Scala, for instance. Right? The second part of algebra is the ability to evaluate expressions like this. Right? So if we evaluate an expression, we'll have to substitute something for x and do the addition multiplication. And again, from the programmer's point of view, we can look at the tree and say, 
Okay, how do I evaluate this tree? Well, we'll evaluate it like bottom up, right? So, so the first node, says, so what is th three? Three is a number, let's say a double, right? What is X? X is a variable, it's a, it's a string, right? Um, we have to assign a value to it. So we'll, we'll, we'll come up with an evaluator that says, well, let's substitute five for X, right? Now we have the node, so we'll multiply this value three with this value, which will be now five. So five times three, I guess 15, right? And then we go here and we do plus 15 plus four, you know, then we evaluate this five times five, 25, right? We add the, the result and we, at the end, we get the result, which is a double. So we know how to form things using trees, data structures, and we know how to go over these data structures. And again, both things are recursive. The data structure is recursive and the evaluation is recursive, right? If we have a deeper tree, we have to go deeper into this. So all you will now write um, in Scala a data structure corresponding to a tree like this. To write a recursive structure, we will start with Scylla trade expert. The first case class const will represent constants and will have one parameter double. This case class extends expert. The second one, variable, has one parameter string to represent the name of the string of the parameter. The case class times is a binary node of the tree. It has two parameters, both of type of expert, which represents the recursivity in our tree. So we have non-recursive leaves, constant var, and recursive binary nodes, times and plus. Let's encode our example. x times x plus 3x plus 4. Here I can probably command a little bit. So we just combine all the case classes that we have. Uh, into an expression that Barthes just uh, had on his board. So this particular expression, x, x squared plus 3x plus 4, now in the form of a data structure, um, can be written as, more formally, this is a plus node, it has two children, one child is, is the times node, right? The times node has two children, and one child is variable whose name is x, right? Another child is also a variable times x. So this kind of uh, the, the writing, the, the, the drawing of the stuff in, th in, in a two-dimensional way is much more readable to, to us humans than writing code. So this is a very nice exercise. So this is plus, and we have times, okay. We have const, const three. So here's a double, right? Here we have variable x. Again, the same x as here. And finally, we have const four okay and so this is a graphical description of of the code that that all you wrote on the computer let's evaluate this expression an obvious choice to evaluate this expression is to turn it into a single double value we evaluate bottom up starting with leaves a const leaf can be evaluated to the value it contains for evaluation purposes, the variable not can be assigned any value of type double, for instance, 5.
In general, we can write many evaluators, or we can define an evaluator that is parameterized by the value of x. To evaluate the nodes, we have to first recursively evaluate the children nodes producing values of the type double. As you can see, we call eval, and then do the operation on it. Finally, let's evaluate our expression and see the result. So the result is 44. So we decided to evaluate this thing to a double, but there are other possibilities. We can, for instance, evaluate this tree to a string, sort of a pretty printer for expressions. How would we do that? Well, we, we would replace a const 3 with a string 3, right? So a string 3.0, let's say, right? We, can, we know how to convert numbers to strings. Uh, we would leave variable as x, and then we would just combine these things into nodes by concatenating strings and putting uh, operators in between them. So why don't we do that? Let's implement what Bartos said, the pretty printer. So as you can see, it takes the parameter expert and returns a string. The rest is more or less the same. We pattern match on expression, and for each of the case, we produce a string. In case of const, it is evaluated to a string representation of the double it contains, a variable leaf to the name of the variable, and the nodes are evaluated recursively. Again, we call pretty on them and then concatenate them using the operator, left side and right side, and then we will get a string. So now we have two ways of evaluating this tree. One is evaluating it to a double value, and another is to evaluate it to a string. But in principle, we can evaluate a tree. If, it, if we have a way of, of like uh, traversing a tree and turning nodes into values of some type, and it can be an arbitrary type, some of these ways may not make much sense, you know. These are these were the sensible ways that we demonstrated, but you know, there are like infinitely many ways of traversing a tree and turning it into value, and there are infinitely many types of values that you can extract from a tree. I mean, we could, we could do this for vectors, matrices, complex numbers. These are the ways that make sense. Lists, whatever, any data type. Okay. The problem with this is, if you look at these evaluators that, that we have implemented, um, they, they combine, um, they mix two different things. Um, the, 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 the turning of the nodes into values and combining values is one part. The other part is doing the recursion, the traversal, right? The traversal is, is, is done by, by doing recursion. It's like every time we were evaluating a plus node, we had to say, well, let's first evaluate the children. That's the recursion part. Then once the children are evaluated to, let's say, to double, then let's add these two doubles. Or if they are evaluated to a string, let's concatenate these strings with an operator in between. So we would like to factor out these two things, do the recursion in a most general way once and for all. Like this recursive part can be encapsulated into one thing and then the particular way in which we are evaluating and combining values, that's another part. And this, this other part will be called the algebra. So the way to factor out recursion 
from this picture is to define a data structure which deals only with one level of this tree. So for instance, we can define a, a, a data structure that deals with, with leaves, right? So leaves are, are like uh, non-recursive parts by definition. But the next level, what do we do with nodes? So instead of having a node that has children that are also trees, we can say, let's have a node like times, but with children that are just like arbitrary type R. Okay? And when we are doing the evaluation, then we could say, well, let's replace R uh, with double, and we'll have two values of type double, and when we evaluate, we'll just multiply them. And when we have plus, we'll replace it with a, with a node that has two values of the same type R. So when we are doing the evaluation, we'll replace this with double, let's say, and, and we'll have values of type double, we'll multiply, here we'll, we'll add them, right? If, the, if, if we replace R with strings, then we do the concatenation here with times, concatenation with plus, right? So this data structure that's parameterized by R is, can be described as a non-recursive data structure. And Oli will now introduce the non-recursive version of this tree. Let's copy our previous result. We'd like to create a data structure that would have placeholders for the results of the evaluation of the children. To do that, let's parameterize our expert by the result type, R. The leaves have no children, whereas the nodes do. So we replace expert with R. In the original recursive definition, the children were full-blown expression trees. Here they are replaced by values of the sum general type R. Also need to rewrite our evaluators. Let's start with eval. Essentially, it does almost the same thing, except it has a different parameter, which we are going to pattern match on. The const and variable stays the same, but for plus and times node, what we're going to do, we're going to get rid of this recursive call, because we know that the types of the parameters are already evaluated to the needed type. Same goes for pretty. It's a lot less boilerplate. So we've had these two evaluators, one evaluating to double, another one evaluating to string. Um, and we could, th there are functions that turn doubles into strings, like to string, right? To string. Can we use this function to transform one evaluator to another evaluator. How would we do that? Well, there are two ways of doing this. One way is take the evaluator, the double evaluator, evaluate an expression, and then apply to string to it, and you'll get a string. The other way of doing this is take an expression and apply to string to the contents of this expression. So for instance, take a node plus f with two doubles and turn these doubles into strings. And then apply the other evaluator, which is the pretty printer evaluator. Okay? 
and see if you get the same result. But what does it mean to apply a function to the content of a node? It means that this data structure has to have a way of mapping functions to the content of the data structure, right? And this is called a functor, a data structure that has this property that you can implement map, which we also say a map is lifting a function. So we have a function like two string, right? Map will take two string, lift it so that it can be applied to an expression and produce a new expression. So it take an, takes an expression of double and produces an expression of string. So let's see if x per f, our data structure, is a functor. Can we implement map for it? To write a functor, we are going to use a cats library, which conveniently contains the functor class. First, we need to import cats and cats implicits. Then uh, we need to define a, an implicit val of type of functor of x per f. And then we need to implement the map function. So what we need to do is to just pattern match on fa parameter and decide what we do in each case. We don't have to do anything with the uh, const leaf and variable leaf, but for our nodes, we need to apply the function f to the left right side and the right side. So as you can see, plus f, f, l, and f, r, which will return f of b at the end. Let's look at simple example. We have one expression. It's an operation plus on two constants, and we want to evaluate it. What we do is we call eval f on plus f, and then we call a pretty printer on plus, but we map it over to string. And the result won't be the same. As you can see, it's not the same. In the first case, it's 3. In the second, 1.0 plus 2. So now we are ready to introduce some definitions. So this, this combination that we were using, um, we, we pick a type uh, and we pick an evaluator that evaluates this type. This, this pair is called an algebra. So if we pick a type, uh, let's call it A, an evaluator is a function that takes f of A to A. You can call it, let's say, A. And the algebra is the, the combination of uh, this type and a function. This type is often called the carrier type, and the function, the evaluator, is called the struct structure uh, map, structure map of the algebra. Okay, so let's write let's write down uh, the definition of a, of an algebra in Scala for a given functor f. We could introduce a type alias algebra which is parameterized by two parameters. The first one is f, which is higher kind of type, and a, our carrier type. And this is equals to function from f of a to a. And we need to rewrite our evaluators again. That's pretty simple. We need to change the name, of course. And then uh, we change the type of the evaluator to algebra x per f and double in case of eval f. Th 
the shape is almost the same except we don't have uh, input parameter now so we can just remove this lines the same Um, please stop the video and just look how simple it is to refactor all these things. We can do the same for any algebra that we have, just simply changing the return type to algebra and leaving the same uh, evaluation, evaluation type string in case of pretty printer. So now let's talk about uh, these mappings of evaluators and that. So they actually become mappings of, of algebras, right? So if we have another algebra uh, that evaluates to some different type B, right? So we have an evaluator B, lowercase b, that evaluates f of B down to B. We, if we have a function that maps A to B, then we can apply this function after evaluating fa. We take fa, this expression, evaluate it down to a, and then apply this function. Or we can first apply f to the contents of this expression using map, right? Because it's a functor. And uh, in category theory, we just write it as f acting on F, okay? So this is the lifting of F um, by functor F. This is really what we call map in Scala. And if this diagram commutes, what does it mean it commutes? Like, this is how we say it in, in, in category theory. We say the diagram commutes if these two paths give the same result. Right, so one path would be F after A, right? The composition of these two functions, first we perform A, then we perform F. It's written in category, categorically as F after A with this little circle. Must be the same as B after F. Well, categorically, we just say FF, right, without the brackets. So this is, this is the commuting of this diagram means that these two compositions of functions are the same. So now, in category theory, we, we operate on these diagrams because it's easier than writing equations. And, and with, these, with these diagrams, we can, we can do things like combine multiple diagrams together. So suppose that we have like a third algebra, you know, F with, with the carrier C, right? And the evaluator C down to C. What if we have two such fun functions, F from A to B and then G from B to C that satisfy this, this commuting condition? So it means that this diagram, F, G here, also commutes. So if this diagram commutes and this diagram commutes, if we combine them together, we get that this path gives us the same result as this path, which means that G after F is also a mapping of algebras. It maps this algebra to this algebra, okay? This algebra to this algebra. So we have a composition of these mappings. Now these mappings of algebras in category theory are called algebra morphisms. So algebra morphisms can be composed together. And moreover, there's one more thing that we can say about them. 
that there is a, an identity algebra morphism. What is an identity algebra morphism? Well, we'll take an algebra FA, A to A, right, FA to A, and identity algebra morphism would map this algebra to itself. So we'll write the same algebra twice, okay? And there is an obvious function from A to A called identity, right? Now, we can lift identity using a functor. Now, functor has this property that it preserves identity, it preserves composition and preserves identity. So, lifting of ID is again ID. So, this diagram will automatically commute because ID after A is the same as ID before A, right? Whether you apply ID before A or after A, it doesn't matter. So, these two things together tells us something, that you can compose algebra morphisms and there is an identity algebra morphism. When you have some structure like this that has composition and identity, it's called a category, okay? So algebras form a category. Why is that important that they form a category? Because now we can apply some ideas from category theory to this. And the first idea that we can apply immediately is that in a category we can define something called an initial object. In this case, we are talking about a category of algebras so we will be talking about an initial algebra. An initial object is an object that has an outgoing morphism to any other object in the category. Translating into algebras, it means an initial algebra is, is an algebra that has an algebra morphism, and in fact, unique algebra morphism to any other algebra. And you might think, okay, is that really possible? Because we've seen that there's like most of these simple uh, functions between carrier types, they are not algebra morphisms. Like two string was not an algebra morphism. We had to think hard to find an algebra morphism um, that was the like make done, right? Um, but it turns out that these algebras that are formed using functors on types in the category of types and functions that we use in programming, that these algebras, they do have initial algebras. And these initial algebras are very important. And with these initial algebras, we can do really interesting things. So let's see what, what an initial algebra, what property does initial algebra have in terms of these, these diagrams. So let, let's say that we have, uh, that the carrier of the initial algebra, we'll call it capital I. So this initial algebra will be F of capital I with an evaluator that evaluates it to I. Okay, and we'll call this evaluator J. We don't know what it is yet, but we'll, we'll find out, okay? The property of initial algebra is that if we have any other algebra, so let's say F A evaluates using A to capital A, then there is a unique morphism from, algebra morphism from I to A. Let's call it M such that this diagram commutes, the lifting of M here, okay? And you might think, okay, what is this initial algebra for our expression? Like we have this functor um, X per F. Is there an initial algebra for this functor? Turns out, that the initial algebra for this functor 
is actually the same thing as the one we started with. Remember the expert? The, the expert data structure, that was the recursive tree, recursive expression tree. Turns out that the recursive expression tree is this I, the initial algebra. And if you have this recursive expression tree, you can always find a morphism that goes into any other algebra. And you can ask the question now, uh, okay, what's the evaluator for this initial algebra? Like how do I turn, you know, X per F, so X per F is this part here, X per F acting on I, and I in our case is X per, the recursive thing. How do I turn this into X per? That's the evaluator J, right? It turns out it's very easy to implement. So the interesting thing about J, the implementation of J, is that it sort of does nothing. It just repackages data from one form to another, takes a double into double, string into string, and, and takes a, a, a node with left and right into a node on left and right. We just give it a different name to this node, right? So because it's repackaging things, it actually is invertible. It's like we can, we can repackage from left to right and we can go back from right to left. And this is a very interesting property. And it's actually uh, a, a theorem. Uh, it's called a Lambex Lemma, which says that the evaluator or the structure map for the initial algebra goes both ways, has an inverse. It's called an uh, isomorphism. This fact that J is an isomorphism, we can write it as F acting on I is isomorphic to I. Isomorphism means that there is a mapping one way and it's inverse going the other way. And it means that for all intents and purposes, fi and i are the same. And we've seen in the implementation of j that it's actually like repackaging stuff. So it's a different way of repackaging the same information, right? Um, and th and this, this um, equation has a name. It's called a fixed point equation. It means that i is a fixed point of the functor f. What does it mean? It means that a fixed point is something that when you act with a functor on it, you get the same thing back, right? It does not modify it. it it's a fixed thing. If you transform it, then you get back the same thing. So it's a fixed thing. Like F acting on any other type will produce a different type. But this one, it actually produces almost the same type up to isomorphism. So this is called a fixed point equation. And it turns out that this fixed point equation can be very easily written in a programming language in Scala. So here's the definition of a fixed point of a functor in Scala. To convince compiler, we need to create a case class, fix, which is parameterized by fix which is also parameterized by something which will have unfix of type of f of fix of f. And this is possible because it's a case class and case classes do allow to contain a recursive definition. We also create a companion object with two functions, in and out, which together form an isomorphism. As you can see, they go from f fix f to fix f and fix f to fix to f of fix of f. We also create a type alias x, 
with fix of f and a bunch of helper functions. So now we know that this initial algebra is actually given by the fixed point of the functor. So we can rewrite this diagram here using the fixed point. So we can say f, our f acting on fix f, or in Scala, right, brackets, it evaluates to fix f, and the evaluator is called in. Okay, because in was going from f fix f to fix f. It also has an inverse, which was out. Okay, Lambex lemma says that this is an isomorphism. But because this is an initial algebra, then there is a unique algebra morphism, M, to any other algebra with a carrier A, so here's f of a, and some evaluator a, right? This is the lifted m. Which is actually map m, right? It's the map lifting of m. And now if we look at this, okay? If we look at this diagram, there are two paths in it. Let's forget about in for a moment. Okay, let me erase this in and concentrate on out. What it says that M is the same as out followed by map M followed by A. Let's call it alg algebra. Okay, this is our algebra. So we can write it as, as a recursive equation, m equals, and I write it in the form, categorical forms like alg after fm after out. And if we if we call M um, kata F, kata alt, then we have an equation, kata alt equals alt after F of kata alt after out, okay? And we can write this formula in Scala. To implement the kata morphism, we will have to write the function kata, which is parameterized by f, which is functor, and a, which is our carrier type. It takes algebra as a parameter, as you can see in the formula, formula kata alg. So we write the same, which is parameterized by our functor and a, and it returns a function which goes from fix f to a. So we start with a fix and then we reverse this categorical expression because we're going to use instead of after we're going to use and then. So we start with out, then we go to our functor, call map on it, with the recursive call of catamorphism, which takes an algebra, of course. And then we move to algebra and apply the fix parameter. This is it. So now that we have implemented this kata, this is a catamorphism, it's called a catamorphism, a catamorphism of this algebra, we can ask the question like, okay, this is an, um, a recursive definition, right? Does this recursion terminate? This is like a well-founded recursion. And the answer is yes. 
And because what it does is it, it first applies out to an expression. So we, we get this recursive expression, the fixed point expression, right? Which, has, which is a complete tree with children and children of children and so on, right? When you apply out to it, you strip like the external constructor from it. So you expose the top level node, right? If this is a, a, a already a, a leaf, then you're just exposing a leaf. And that's a simple case. But if you're exposing a node, um, then you apply uh, lifted catamorphism. You take the catamorphism, you apply it to children of this node, which are complete trees again, right? But the children of a node are smaller than the whole tree. So this, this recursion actually is applied to smaller and smaller subtrees. And eventually it terminates when it hits an, um, a leaf. This is a well-founded recursion, right? So this evaluates the F kata, evaluates the children by mapping Katam catamorphism onto children. And then we get this top level node with evaluated values and we can apply the algebra to it, which just combines these values. So the algebra is the way of combining the values at a single level of a node, right? So now we can rewrite our um, evaluators that we have introduced earlier and the algebras that we define for these evaluators. We can write these evaluators as catamorphisms. How do we evaluate our expressions? We could apply kata to our pretty algebra. And to see the result, let's apply it to second expression. We could do that for any algebra. For eval f or any other. You can find other. the code on the GitHub which and has the same it. type. Enjoy. So let me summarize what we have done. We start with a functor. This functor can be used then to define a recursive data structure. In our case, this was a recursive tree, expression tree, but it could be anything. It could be a list, could be a tree, could be whatever, whatever functor you come up with can be used in this construction. So we have a functor and this functor sort of describes a, like one level non-recursive part of a recursive data structure. And it's much easier to deal with these non-recursive data structures. And we can um, define evaluators that are non-recursive very easily. But then we have this orthogonal direction, which tells us how to create recursive data structures from these non-recursive functors, right? Using fixed points. So this is how we define trees, lists, and so on. And once we have this, we can then apply this algebra, this uh, single level evaluator to a recursive data structure, full blown recursive data structure using a catamorphism. And this catamorphism is implemented once and for all. You have it in the library, you can use it. So you, 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 can, you can plug in a functor, you can plug in a particular algebra, and you get an evaluator for a recursive data structure. And this is the power of this approach. Thank you.
All right, I can stop sharing my screen. And I've seen that Bartosz joined us. Bartosz, do you want to say a couple of words? And so am I speaking to like, everybody in the conference? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So uh, I'm really happy that I could do this, uh, but I really, really wish I could go to Ukraine and, and be there in person. But, you know, unfortunately things happen. So, um, so we did our best to be in, at least in spirit there. Um, so if you have any questions, I can answer questions about category theory and Oli can answer questions about Scala code. So someone asks, is the code available on GitHub? Yes, the code is available. Uh, we posted a link in the blog post. And, and there is a link in the in the chat. The there is a link in here. the chat. Yeah, yeah, I shared it. Okay. Yeah. So I really wish we had more time, you know, because we could like give more examples. Like yeah. <laughs> there was one place when I said, okay, two string is not an algebra morphism, right? But there are algebra morphisms and we actually have an example of it. And, and it's, it's, it, it's in the blog, uh, yeah. but we couldn't show it because of the time constraint. But there are algebra morphisms really. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Artus, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Um, do you plan uh, to write um, any other book? Because I read your uh, category theory and yeah, it's uh, a lot of pages there. So uh, what's uh, uh, what your plan for the next book? So actually, Yes. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I, I had a series of, of lectures uh, um, at MIT with, with two mathematicians, David Spivak and Brendan Fong. Uh, and it was uh, more mathematical, uh, but it was, it was also category theory and programming, sort of. So we, uh, we decided to teach at the same time category theory and Haskell. So this is Has not Scala, sorry. <laughs> Haskell has a much uh, easier notation um, that more similar to, to mathematical notation. So it's, it's, a, it's a better choice when you want to talk about category theory. So we are working on a book and, and the videos are available. They're, they're available on YouTube. Uh, so it uh, should we buy it or just, uh, you know, um, uh, is there any link or something like that? To the videos? Yes, yes. Yeah. Someone uh, shared uh, already on the chat. Yeah? Is yeah. there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Link. Okay, you too. Thank you. I will take a look. Is that it? No. Okay. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, hi, Bartosz. My name is Vladimir. And thank you for a great talk. For me, it's quite advanced material. Uh, the question is, uh, how many companies or startups do you know who uses such approaches in commercial development? Because it's, as academic, it's really cool. Can I, but how can about uh, real this? production? Can I answer this question? Because uh, it's no probably problems. better. Okay. Yeah, yes. I'm working at Solutions Architect at 47 degrees and I'm working with a lot of companies. I'm a consultant there. And uh, surprisingly to me, I had to learn recursion schemes because our client used that. It's a good approach when you're building DSL and you want to build a query uh, on a recursion structure. Whenever you traverse through the structure, uh, you want to use recursion schemes. 
I mean, if it's uh, something like uh, non-trivial, when it's trivial, it's better to go with the usual approach. When it's not trivial, it's probably better to invest once into things like catamorphism or halomorphisms, and then uh, just be uh, uh, focused on your business logic instead of traversing at the same time. Does it make sense? Yes, it's made, but uh, it's a common sense uh, or some special kind of businesses uses it. So uh, I've seen three in production and all three were uh, financial institutions. I don't know if it's like something in common, but basically they have analytics who are working and using some uh, kind of the DSL, the language, and they're writing queries and then they are translated to Scala using recursion schemes. So same as J, as we've seen the initial algebra, we have uh, like the same kind of mapping going from the type of DSL to Scala. And it looks similar to this, like uh, uh, string to string, I don't know, number to number and so on and so forth. So it's uh, also, I know a friend who got inspired by my previous talk at FBI and he works on an open source project called Heliosis, I think. So it's something with um, mapping and uh, geographical stuff. And they need the same like DSL for uh, combining and in introspecting the uh, part of the maps or uh, some ge geographical stuff. And they're using that in production too. So I, I don't think it's uh, related uh, to, it, it's limited to financial institutions, but because Scala is broadly uh, used there, uh, regression schemes are used there too. Does it answer your question? Uh, yes, answered. And uh, uh, I've met a couple of years ago uh, one of the guys who wrote Matryoshka, and they are mm -hmm. also from finance domain. Maybe it's yes. category theory, it's for big money, big buck. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. thanks. Uh, good, good answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I could add to this uh, also um, that we have really just scratched the surface of, of this thing. It's like, as, as Ali mentioned, that there are, there are more recursion schemes. There is also, uh, a, my favorite is hylomorphism. Hylomorphism, and, and we, have, we have like co-algebras, and co-algebras have anamorphisms. And when you combine anamorphism with a catamorphism, then you have like a completely new, powerful way of doing calculations. It's like here we, we see, uh, you, you know, the data structure that we were talking about, the expression tree. Okay, it's obvious that it corresponds to something. It corresponds to like data, right? But in a hylomorphism, you, you actually create a data structure that, uh, that does not really correspond to data in a way. It corresponds to the way you evaluate. It just tells you what path you are taking to evaluate you know so it, it's a really a control structure it's like the simplest control structures that we have okay you have a list go over this list that's a we can call it a loop or, or a fold right but it's a control thing looping folding right now you can generalize this using using hylomorphism you can say well, I want to do some much more complex uh, calculation uh, and I don't really have a good control structure. I don't have a loop for this that's built into the language. Uh, I don't have a library for this that would encapsulate this, like, you know, maybe. Uh, and, and then you build a data structure in your mind, sort of, you know, and that serves as control for doing your calculation, right? 
it's like I've done this many times when, when I have a problem where I, especially with mutual recursion, you know, it's like you write a function that calls another function that's recursive, calls itself back and so on. The logic of this is, gets so complex, you know, and it, it's so easy to make mistakes. But when you look at the control as a data structure, then suddenly everything simplifies. And then if you use the algebras, then you simplify it to like a single level of control. You don't really do the recursion at this level, you know, and it's so much easier to write code that it's like almost immediately correct and you don't have to debug it. So that's, that's how I use it. Yeah, and a few people in the chat said that they're using uh, recursion schemes. Someone wanted to say something? I, I think uh, some of our applications that we develop are kind of trivial that we just copy strings and, and stuff like that and it has some business logic but actually the program logic is trivial but uh, we can with Scala do the non-trivial things and that's what is addressed by this talk I guess. Thank you. And another thing uh, that we interject is uh, of course, you can learn recursion schemes without category theory. You know, you can just memorize the stuff, you know, you can go through the library and figure out, okay, this is what I'm supposed to use and, and uh, okay, this is how you use it, the mechanics of it and so on. Um, category theory is just useful for some people. For me, it's very useful because it just gives me a shorthand to talk about this stuff so that I, I, can, I can say one sentence in category theory that describes like a whole bunch of sentences about programming. So that's, that's, a, that's a higher level of abstraction that is extremely useful for me. Maybe not for everybody, but for me, this is like understanding how this thing was derived is extremely important. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, the question. Uh, um, it's a very nearby question, but uh, how how can you define algebra? Because it's a term which is low, which is used a, uh, a lot in mathematics, in uh, functional programming, for example, with free monad, with finally tagless, but What's the, the, ens the essence of an algebra? So this, so this is what I started like the talk with, you know, like what is algebra, right? Like in high school, you learn one way of looking at it and categorically, it's a completely different thing. Uh, so in category theory, the algebra is just this pair, an object. We, in our case, it's a type, right? And the morphism uh, that goes from an endo functor acting on this type to this type, that's all. So you pick an object, you, you have a, an endo functor to begin with, a functor that mo transforms objects in a category into, uh, into objects in the same category. That's why it's endo, it's the same category, right? Just like a monad is also an endo functor, right? So, so you have to have an endo functor, you pick an object and you pick a morphism, that's it. It's very simple. Does that okay. answer the question? Okay, thank you, it's, it's good to me. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> what kind of uh, exotic category theory techniques uh, which are more exotic, for instance, than Kleistly you use in practice? Recursion schemes. Yeah, recursion I talked recursion about. Recursion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> recursion schemes, yes. Huh? Or, um, I'm currently writing a blog post, uh, which I, uh, I posted the first um, step of the recursion schemes fundamentals on 47. 
Greece website and I'm writing another one about the uh, how to write all the sorting algorithms using regression schemes. It's a lot of fun. I'm not sure I cannot guarantee when it's going to be ready. It's going to be ready because I'm super duper busy, but at least we're going to write the second part with Bartish about the anamorphism. So, and yeah. these techniques are indeed practical. They can be used uh, in production with some uh, exceptions. Sometimes it makes sense to go with the uh, straightforward approach and have explicit uh, recursion without that, but uh, it's interesting exercise for brain, for me at least. If yeah, Every I, time I see, I, I write something with recursion, um, I have this feeling like I must be doing something wrong. There has to be a recursion scheme to cover this, right? Yeah. And there are so many of them. Catamorphism and anamorphism is just the beginning. Hylomorphism is beginning, but there are zikomorphisms, paramorphisms, and whatnot. And uh, they all are interesting, and they are there for optimization of some algorithms, like uh, intermediate step, for example, and things like that. And but uh, definitely, hylomorphism is the most useful of these, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that's true, that's true. You have true. to learn high more. I Actually, also, uh, I, I, I started writing like the second, uh, working on the second part of, of, of our blog. Uh, uh, and actually I, uh, I went into explaining how this uh, algebra stuff works for lists, because this is like the most useful thing, you know, it's like the basic thing, lists. Yeah. You know? yeah. Because uh, we explained it on trees, right? But lists are even simpler. So I, I wrote a, a, a little bit explanation of lists and, and Oli will uh, fill in uh, yeah. Scala part of it, right? Like <laughs> yes. <Scala. laughs> right? And actually all divide and conquer algorithms on lists like uh, quick sort, uh, merge sort, uh, merge mm -hmm. sort more about tree, but uh, all the, these types of algorithms can be done with Hilo. Yeah, yeah, and so, and uh, quicksort even even quicksort actually involves a tree, right? Yeah, it's like you are yeah, sorting yeah. a list, but, but you are splitting yeah. it into halves yeah. and halves and yeah. halves and halves, and you are growing a tree, and then you are uh, folding this tree back. Yeah. I have a question um, on a Curie award point of view, um, uh, what do uh, recursion schemes uh, give us? Uh, do they uh, enable us to have proof carrying code? Um, like, for example, termination of a sorting algorithm. Well, we, we talked a little bit about uh, termination in, in the talk uh, because recursion is related to um, induction, right? So when, when you are doing induction, uh, you, you have to prove that the induction terminates, that, that there is, uh, is well-founded induction, right? So well-founded recursion. So in the case of, of these trees, expression trees, it's important that the recursion is well-founded, that eventually you'll get to leaves and then you stop, right? But, but these, these are things that are not really expressible in languages like Scala or even Haskell uh, because you know, proofs are not first uh, level objects, right? Maybe if you go to Agda or, or Calc, then yeah, then maybe maybe this, this yeah. And, and termination in general is is a difficult problem. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Maybe I should mention something. Uh, like why 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 are these recursion schemes so useful? 
because this is this is really the part of category theory that like immediately uh, has its usefulness in programming, and 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 in fact when 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 I was teaching uh, category theory for programmers uh, uh, last month, uh, two months ago, yeah, uh, I insisted on putting algebras before everything else, sort of like, okay, here's the definition of a, a, a category. Uh, here are some simple things like initial objects, terminal objects, and then go immediately into algebras because without algebras, you can't really do anything. You cannot do any recursive data structures. You cannot, you know, like in functional programming, you don't have loops, right? How can you program without loops? You have to use recursion. And this is where, where the algebras come in. And, uh, and, and recursion schemes help you uh, split your work sort of, for, for me, it's like splitting it vertically. So um, you, you have to, uh, when you are programming, you have to deal with two levels, at least two levels. One is the global level, like what am I doing, right? The big picture. And then the small level, like what are the little things that I'm doing? Like, you know, at the bottom of, of, of the recursion tree, right? What am I doing? And, and, and the most difficult part of, about programming is that we cannot deal with both at the same time as humans. Uh, computers have no problems with it, but we, we humans, like we cannot keep track of the whole stack of abstractions. So we have to like, at one moment, concentrate on the big picture and forget about the details and then switch our mind to concentrate on the little picture and forget about the big picture, like forget where we are uh, in the big picture and concentrate on like, what are, what are we doing here? Adding this to this and multiplying this by this and so on, right? The nitty gritty things. And, and not every problem is, can be divided into big picture and small picture. This is like, these are the problems that we can actually solve, the ones that are divisible, right? That we can decompose into big picture and small picture. And this decomposition into big picture and small picture, this is exactly what recursion schemes do. They, they find like the right level of cutting it, okay? So here above this, you have these fixed points things that talk about the big picture, right? This is like, you're looking at the whole thing and you're saying, well, this is sort of like approaching the fixed point, right? And then you have the algebra itself, which tells you, well, you are here at the node, okay? You're not interested in, in the whole tree. You're just at the node. And at this node, you have just like two children and they are already evaluated. They are just values. What do you do with these values? Well, you add them, you multiply, them, you concatenate them, right? And in the business logic. Right, exactly, yeah. And this ability to separate the big picture from the small picture is, is extremely important. And people often, like beginner programmers, they will mix these things and they will write this really elaborate, complicated functions that have loops inside loops, inside loops. And it's like, oh, I'm at the bottom of this loop, but I'm uh, modifying something at the top. And, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm in the... In innermost loop, but I'm changing the counter of the outermost loop, okay? So it will, next time it will go and do something completely different and so on. This is like, no, no, don't do this, <laughs> right? Humans cannot deal with this. Computers will, but humans cannot. So uh, recursion schemes give you this, this tool to say, this is above the line, this is below the line, this is the line. Right? This is the functor separates these two things. Here's the functor and here's the fixed point above. Below, you're dealing with just a simple functor, plus, minus, concatenate, blah, 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 right? That's what I like about it. Okay, there is this chat here. Uh, diagram commutes. 
if these two paths give the same result. But in example, we have different results. String one, one, yeah. Does it mean that in that case, the diagram doesn't commute? Yes, <laughs> it doesn't commute, yeah. It doesn't commute. So like this diagram has to commute in order for this to be an algebra morphism, right? Yeah. And this was a, like a counter example. Hey, you can think of a morphism and it's not an algebra morphism because this diagram doesn't commute. That was, that was the thing. And unfortunately, we didn't have time to, to do a positive example where uh, actually does commute, but this example is in the blog. So if you can look up in the blog um, an example in which the diagram actually commutes and it is an algebra morphism. So not every function is, becomes an algebra morphism. That was the main point. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for asking your questions. It's a pleasure to communicate with you and have a great weekend. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Same to you. Yeah. Thank you very much for patience, yeah. etc. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.